This episode is brought to you by Act Now Education. Warriors, fall in. It's time for formation. Today I'm honored to have a guest who's going to share some very important tips that will help our military community create better resumes and complete online applications to take that next step in the hiring process. But before we move on, I need to acknowledge our trusty co-host, Avi. Avi, how you doing this week, buddy? Pretty good, KP. Excited for the episode, as always. Sound like you had your coffee, uh, your afternoon coffee, anyhow. So, uh, so, so let's get to it. So here on The Morning Formation, we are laser-focused on providing you the best tips from veterans who have paved the path to help you make better decisions. Our guest today is John Morgan, and he's, he works for Work for Warriors Georgia as an employment coordinator. And today we're going to learn about his resume hacks, his organization, and his position with Work for Warriors Georgia. John, I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you, KP. I'm I'm happy to be here. The honor is all ours. So, John, first of all, (laughs) I'd like for you to tell us about your organization, Work for Warriors Georgia. I'm interested to uh, know a little bit more about this uh, specific organization. Well, the Work for Warriors Georgia program is started about five years ago, back in 2017. We're, we're starting into our fifth year. Um, it, we are an employment assistance team. Uh, we are DOD funded. So we are um, sponsored by the Georgia Army National Guard's Family Assistance Program. And so when it comes down to it, uh, we have two missions uh, statements as far as on that. One, we support the, the servicemen. We support all servicemen, not just National Guard or reserve we support all servicemen of all branches and their spouses and so what we do for them is that we uh, we do resume building uh, coaching uh, educational training and also we we look at you know as far as on the coaching part of it the interview process like uh, like I said the most common interviews that go out there today is like here like on video uh, also by phone or by in person and I'll, I'll say one tip as far as when you do a video, make sure you're fully clothed, everyone. <laughs> there, there's been some cases on on that many of times. So uh, it's nothing embarrassing when you're asked to stand up and see your full appearance and you're, you have to say, oh, I, I have to take a brief pause. I'm not wearing anything. And yeah, that's that's not a good, good sign right there. <laughs> uh, as far as our second part of our mission, uh, we, we work with employers that are veteran friendly. Uh, that those uh, we we help educate those employers that that have no veterans that work for them. There's a lot of them still out there. I know in one of your previous episodes, you know, you talked about like anywhere from five to eight percent of the employers out there that actually have military experience. That's that's about right on the money because um, Georgia Tech had pushed out of here um, about a year or so ago. Is about ninety four percent that does not have um, any military experience or anything else like that. So. That's where we can educate employers. Uh, one one example I had, I had a school system uh, that came came to me says, John, I, I am looking for diesel engine mechanics, and I have four um, four that came from the army, and they were heavy and light wheel mechanics. But then in their resumes, they stated they didn't state they were diesel engine mechanics. Well, first I, I assured her, I said look, do not turn those people down. You need to go back and research them again. I said, they are diesel engine mechanics. So uh, she was like, oh, thank you very much. She had to call her assistant and say, hey, do not send those emails um, out just yet. We want to go back and call and call these individuals. So that's when it comes down to, as far as with the employers that are out there that are not military savvy, they can we can educate as far as on that. <laughs> now, our biggest You're concern is for... Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. You're basically no, no. You're you're basically. I think we have a little bit of a lag here, um, because it says you're only at twelve percent. But it says that um, basically, work for Warrior Georgia. What they do is they bridge that gap between the translation of culture between the military and civilian employment is what it sounds like. That's correct, KP. Um, like I said, we 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 are like the mediators between the servicemen and the employers. So when, like, like when we 
do the introductions to both sides, Finn, it's up to both sides whether or not. After we do the meet and greet on both sides, Finn, our job is pretty much done. It's up to that individual serviceman or spouse or that employer to, to do it. So it's no obligation on either side. So that's one of our biggest challenges is that we face is that being the mediator is that um, and doing the introductions is that the employer has no um, obligation to hire that person. All they're obligating to is that when we provide them with that candidate, we are telling them that we're showing them that that person meets the criteria of what they're looking for. Now, when it comes down to the personality, the interview or anything else like that, then that's where it comes on to both sides. And then like I said, with the servicemen, they might not like what they want to hear as far as when it comes down to uh, as far as the job description itself, once they start doing, getting into the weeds, talking with that, uh, with that hiring manager, and then, like I said, it's it's no obligation on either side. But we do have, like I said, uh, we have a lot of uh, partnerships across the state of Georgia. Uh, I'm one of seven employment coordinators, uh, and I work 33 counties of, of the state, so I cover all the coastal counties of Georgia, uh, along with in, in into the inner. Part of Georgia so it's uh, uh, so we have a lot most of my focus base has been in the Savannah area Fort Stewart because uh, we have Hunter Army Airfield um, and also Fort Stewart and then down in Brunswick Georgia we have Kings Bay which is we, we are partnered up with our sister organization in Florida uh, to um, to help those that kind of live on the border and going to Jacksonville and then also here in the Savannah area those that work in the South Carolina area uh, they have their own program as well, so it's it's a it's a lot of networking, a lot of uh, a lot of hands on on deck as far as trying to assist that serviceman or spouse. Excuse me. You know, I never th I never thought about it before, but that whole area is full of military bases, and Georgia specifically is full of military bases. What's your outreach like? Do you know how many folks you've actually served? As far as the last three years. Uh, since I've worked with the Work Warriors program, since I've retired. Um, now, my first year, I was working as a career counselor through our sister program sponsored by National Guard Bureau. I had a little bit more on that. Now, as far as overall, uh, I would say right now in our database for Work for Warriors, we have about over five, 6,000 uh, candidates uh, that we have previously worked with, continuously working with, and, um, and then my previous, uh, so right now, but... In my last three years, as far as assisting just with employment, uh, I've I, yesterday I, I received my 105th uh, as far as candidate that um, that got accepted in work. Now it's not with all the employers. Uh, I highly encourage not just to look at the employers we provide them, but also do their own searching and researching. So I do a lot of coaching and, and continues how they can search for jobs. But like I said, it, it's been a big milestone, especially with COVID here. Because right when I changed over to programs, a few months later, COVID hits. And then it was like I went from education in my career counseling days as far as not just employment, but financial counseling and everything else. And then going just in employment. And then COVID hits. And it's like uh, no one's hiring and everybody's staying home because of COVID. And everything was shutting down. So it was... It's been a big challenge, but it's 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 been a it's been a wonderful challenge at that. It's been very rewarding to me. Now, John, I'm glad you brought that up because you know taking any you know taking a quick look at your LinkedIn profile, it's no secret that you have over 27 years of experience between your military and your current endeavors, and that's amazing. Now, with that experience, also comes lessons learned, new perspective and insight. Now I'm wondering if that experience or your experience with the National Guard has changed the way you approach your job as an employment coordinator or if it influences you in any way to bring about new approaches to the employment system especially for transitioning military. Uh, as far as with as far as with my years of experience, I mean I, I started as career counselor uh, in my fifth year. I was a part-time soldier I was working uh, civilian jobs I was going from sales I had started my own company with with my father uh, in water jet manufacturing cutting seals and gaskets and so we had that I had that dynamic a little bit when I came in came into the guard I always wanted to serve active duty so when I had the opportunity to come into the active guard reserve program 
for the Georgia Army National Guard. It was a wonderful thing. But then the first thing they put me in was that I was at retention NCO. I was that um, retention manager. I was that career counselor for each of the soldiers part time. And so that's where it really, really began for me. So I, I had my high numbers. I showed soldiers uh, one of the biggest things always for that within the National Guard. And I can say for probably the reserves as well has always been employment. Uh, that's one of the reasons that most want to get out. They feel that uh, their guard or reserve experience um, hinders them as far as in their employment. Uh, they do not have to explain to their supervisor or to their boss or to their company how what they do on the drill weekends. They just m most of the employers I have talked to over the years think that they're just asking for a free weekend and they're just going off and partying now. And and that's what and that's what the stereotyping that that most employers like i said they had no military experience they didn't know what we were doing and so that's where it was really coming down to as far as on that um as far as so that like i said was as far as motivating um also with with that as far as on educational terms and um and like i said i've had a lot of uh, a lot of experience as far as on that and one thing as I always I did I was always honest with the soldiers I, I was just like I never sugarcoated it I basically told them what it is here it is and you could take it or leave it and for the most part most of them took it because that's the way I put it to them I'm, I'm not going to sit there and hold their hand and that's how I was when I was a retention manager and I've had to kind of change that a little bit because now that I'm working more of in the civilian aspect but then on the same token I am working with transitioning soldiers and all that, and sometimes I have to be abrupt like that. <laughs> That's that yeah, military certainly... culture right there. You could <laughs> definitely use it in way more aspects than you think. Uh, yeah. Most definitely. I mean, it's 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 a whole like I said, it's a whole different culture than than the civilian world. Like I said, I was blessed with coming on active duty with the National Guard for the for my last twenty years of service. And like I said, I had the culture of both working with both both active duty and part time soldiers that were seeking employment and having to counsel them. So I, I think I was better off than most when I was doing my own personal transitioning. But it was um, it was it, it was still an experience for me, uh, even trying to look into the into the networking of going from what I was doing prior to I got accepted for this job. Uh, or this position in in going in and doing search into that the career world it, it's 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 phenomenal it's it's, it's very difficult <laughs> yeah most certainly and just like avi mentioned you have over 25 years of national guard military experience and over that span of time you witnessed others transition out of the military can you talk about some of the some of the dynamics of the National Guard versus active duty. Would you mind sharing some of those experiences as far as how they both components work and what you've seen over the years as far as transition? As far as the, um, as far as the National Guard and, and active duty, yes. I mean, they still had the same mission in mind um, as far as what they do on both times. The only difference is, is that active duty, you do that one certain job every day, uh, whether you, you're infantry, engineer, artillery, uh, and then, so you're you're focused on that one particular task. As far as with the National Guard, and I'll say reserve, I'll, I'll say the other, them as well, is that we are part time, or those soldiers are part time. They do their one weekend month. They're two weeks out of the training. So yes, uh, there's a lot of catch up. A, a lot of times when they come activated and go overseas, yes, you have to kind of get them back in that mind frame of a everyday active duty uh, mentality. But like I said, the same missions are still implied. Uh, as far as with employment itself is seeing what I've seen is like it's still the same issues on both sides whether you're transitioning or guard reserve it's hard to explain what you do to that employer uh, in a more civilian friendly atmosphere um, many shy away from it when they do not understand uh, what you do for the military if they've never served and so that's that's been the biggest things right there um, one of the biggest things I had um, going for me uh, was Army e-learning. I was able to show soldiers uh, that were in the Guard that that was a wonderful tool to get civilian training education. Uh, that's been around for almost 30 years. One of the things that really bothers me is every time I ask uh, a transitioning soldier or current soldier 
or whether active duty guard or reserve, I asked them first, one of the first questions I asked them, I said, how much have you done on Army e-learning? And then I get that deer in the headlights look, and I was like, how do you not know about this? This is, this is crazy because this, this site has been around ever since right when the dawn of the internet. I mean, when I was in service, I found it, and I had been taken, I had taken thousands of courses, thousands of hours, I mean, as far as on the courses online, I was able to show soldiers uh, and say, because I had soldiers say, hey, I want to go back to school. I want to focus on school. I have GI Bill. And then I look at them. I said, if I can show you an opportunity to get free education and do it self-paced and online and get the same certifications, would you stay in in the guard? And then the first thing they look at me and says, well, there is no such thing. And then when I show them, it was like, okay, where do I sign up? Because I said, you can only use this while you're in the guard and or in military service. And then now, from what I've seen over over the years uh, working this, is that all the components have a certain similar um, um, outcast as far as our website that does the civilian components. So I highly encourage everyone to seek out your career advisors for your component and and see what what's available. I, I certainly think that it is up to the military leaders to impress upon the soldiers to take advantage of the free education opportunities. And that was something that I sought out to do when I was a lieutenant in active duty. My background as well is I was enlisted in the National Guard. So a lot of the things that you're talking about, I can, I can kind of grin at because <laughs> I, was, I was a part of that. I was a part of that. And I, I kind of understand both mentalities as far as um, you know, the way of thinking. And I think that's a great sell that you just brought up right there. When you make the impossible sound possible, and you make it sound like, you know, what's in it for me, when you make it sound like that, it's a lot easier for someone to see the benefits over those weekends that sneak up on you and those Muta 4s, Muta 5s, those the ATs that you have to go to over the summers. It makes it a lot easier to bear <laughs> when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to understanding that, hey, you can really invest in yourself. And exactly when when I was and in the I guard, just want to add on oh, to I'm what sorry. KP's go ahead, go ahead. saying right there. No, you're good, John. I just wanted to add on to what KP's saying right there. Especially in this age right now, the dawn of the internet, we have so many opportunities, both online, in person, virtual, hybrid. Just an infinite amount of possibility for e-learning right now, both in and out of the military. So, as someone who's trying to transition into the Air Force. There are countless opportunities for me, not just to familiarize myself with the army, the army, the military culture, but also to prepare myself for what I expect to be doing in the service. For example, cyber ops, taking college courses, not even enrolled, you know, just just taking college courses as a non-degree seeking student, doing e-learnings and certification courses, joining and volunteering for various organizations. It's just a, a plethora of opportunities for you, even if you're transitioning into the military. So for those listening out there, don't think that just because you're in your 20s or in your teens and looking to get into the military, that this doesn't apply to you. It, exactly. I mean, it's it's like I said, there's a lot of educational opportunities that servicemen in all services miss while they're in while they're in service and then it's like oh when they get out and it's like oh i had that opportunity uh yeah i'm sorry but then now you no longer do so i encourage all transitional service members now unless you're retiring uh with uh medically or traditionally uh but for that's understandable you can't go into the guard reserve but I always encourage everyone to go into the guard or reserve components uh, of their branch or even a different branch. Reason why I say that because you keep that networking going uh, as far as in the military community. Uh, you still keep some benefits. Like I said, now the track here reserve select is out there for at least on the guard and reserve side. And so as far as on the benefit side, I mean, also too, as far as, uh, you know, you have the potential of going back to active duty a lot easier than someone that leaves out. So if you say, well, the guard is not for me, I can't make it in the civilian world, which a lot happens, then they have that opportunity to go back in the guard reserve and keep their uh, years of service going. Um, so that's as far as with education and training. Um, when I was in the guard, 
uh, as far as on part time and then a little bit on the full time side. Uh, I, I attained 10 MOS's military occupation skills and that went from engineering to field artillery to infantry to uh, re recruiting and retention and then also human resources so it, it i had a very diverse so when i had a sergeant major tell a soldier one time says uh you know i have the sergeant major was telling the soldier he says i have five mos's and you know you should continue your education he looked over at me so like he figured i had like two or three and i he, he goes the sergeant major looks at me and says uh, how many you have there, Sergeant Morgan? I said, well, I have 10, Sergeant Major. I mean, he looks at me. I said, well, here's my record sheet because it was kind of like unheard of. And so I, I went for every educational training that there was, and it was available to me at that time. John, I'm really glad that we have you as a guest on today's show, and it's mainly because you have the National Guard experience. And I haven't, I don't believe in my recollection we've had anyone part of the Reserve or National Guard on the show before so I find that kind of unique and I'd like to ask you since you've been part of Work for Warriors Georgia what has been your involvement specifically anyone out there listening right now who's looking to contact you what specifically can you offer them as far as services suggestions or advice what what is what has been your main role with Work for Warriors well when I started out with the program I was I was still in service uh, the my predecessor that was had started in this program the sister organization like i mentioned earlier uh, i was i was i was the operations manager for armory and i i help assist the my predecessor in in getting established and getting the program established within within the area of fort stewart and the other areas of georgia uh he he came to me and said, hey, John, I've been at Fort Stewart for the last couple of months over at the National Guard Training Center. I haven't hardly had any contact with anyone. And it was like, and then employers, and then I didn't even know about his organization. But when he mentioned who his boss was, uh, a lieutenant colonel that I had, I had worked with previously over the years and went uh, deployment to Iraq with. And then I first thing I just called him up. I had his personal cell phone. That's a little bit of difference between the Guard and Reserve is that uh, a sergeant first class having a lieutenant colonel or full board colonel's um, phone number and calling them directly and saying, hey, sir, what's what's going on? Is this personal legit or not? Because that was the first thing I did is that anyone that came into my armory and said they were representing a veterans program, I researched them, make sure that they were legit, and then make sure they were not there to take advantage of veterans. Because there are some organizations out there that like to take advantage of veterans in, 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 in seeking employment or anything. And when I found out he was legitimate, I gave him an office, uh, set him up. And because my office right outside of Hy or at Fort Stewart in Hinesville, Georgia, it's the busiest armory that I have ever been in because we have a lot of foot traffic coming through, whether it's veterans, employers, the community itself. And it was, it was, it was, um, he was amazed after within a week's time, he had more contacts than he, with people and employers and all that than he had in the previous two months when the program started. And then we had, became very good friends uh, Jeff and I did and then we continued until he was offered a position up in up in Atlanta where he was from he was looking at moving back and then he's like where are you at on your transitioning and him and I've been talking conversing uh, of the issues that I'd been seeking um, trying to look for employment and he says hey would you like to take my job and I was like or would you like to apply for my position I said sure most definitely and and so he reached out to his boss, uh, who's the uh, retired sergeant, state sergeant major of Tennessee, and and he was our regional manager. Within a week, he had me on an interview. We had phone interview, uh, two phone interviews, and after that, I was hired. So the day I left left the guard to my transitional service, I the next day I was one day I was in uniform. The next day I came in back in wearing this right here and and then i've been there ever or been like i said between two programs so the running joke is for my national guard armory and my unit that, that i support there is is like uh you've been here through the guard you've been here through two programs and you're still here and two staffs have already rotated in and out so it's it's, it's the funniest part of <laughs>
No, John, that's hilarious. It's it's nice to see that even though you have a lot of experience with different things, you're still t- you know making a a good joke out of it. But you know, continuing on here, I know that especially with how many transitioning service members are out there and in need of assistance, it can be pretty difficult to take heed of cookie cutter advice. Like, hey, do this, do that, do this, you know, jump through the hurdles, do e-learnings, go through some resume revisions, and go through the job search and you'll be all right. And some may still feel that after all that and more, they still aren't making the progress that they need to be or as quickly as they should be. What can you advise to these people out there that just need some extra advice or maybe are in a very, very unique life situation? As far as the situation, I, I, I tell any transition, if, if they're if they're still in service, they need to take every opportunity they can while they're in service to start doing their networking, start doing their um, outreach uh, to to companies and everything else like that. Uh, is like we were talking about as far as cookie cutter. Um, I, I start my program with, with a uh, with a person. The first thing I ask them, I say, "Do you have a resume?" And then I ask them to send it or forward it to me so I can view it before I speak to them. And I give them tips for, and suggestions of what I see on there. Uh, many things when it comes down to the resume is, is that you're going to have to have multiple versions of your resume. If you want to use Indeed or if you want to use ZipRecruiter, that's great. But you're only going to be able to apply for jobs within Indeed and ZipRecruiter. If you try to take those resumes and send them out separately, you download them and send it out separately, then nine times out of 10, that's not going to work. Or 10 times out of 10, it's not going to work because it's totally different formats than what most employers look at. Uh, so when, but then also too, I try to work myself out of a job with, with these, in, with these uh, servicemen and spouses. And when I mean, mean by that is I give them all the tips of the trade as far as uh, how to build their resume, how to maintain their resume, how to tweak their resume as far as changes. Because um, when I get a little bit more into this, as far as with the resume building and applying online, it's it's um, it's it's phenomenal. Because like I said, uh, in going back to one of your previous episodes, there KP is like when you're talking about personal branding and your personal space. So I could write the resume for them, but it's going to be a basic resume. And it's not going to be a personality resume, and then and then when and it's not going to fit them personally, and then it's the employer is going to see that, and that's where you call it when you talk about cookie cuttering. And, and if you do that, if you have someone else write your resume for you, then that's where you're not going to get the personality. So that's what one of the things I try to teach, I try to instruct, and try to coach. And then I just follow up later on. So like if you don't want to, you know, talk to the employers that we have personally. Uh, or if you do, and then you're still looking at other options um, and doing your own thing and in, in, in applying for jobs, then it's um, that's what I try to teach as far as coaching. Because, like I said, I might not be here all the time. Like I said, we are a DOD funded program. And it's like what that same lieutenant colonel uh, that I spoke with when the program started is that he said, hey, this program could go at any time. So while we're here, Educate your educate your servicemen, educate your spouses to better themselves, better themselves, and to um, and in doing their own in, resume and employment. I know now with the day, I, I would say years ago, twenty years ago when I came in, or twenty five years ago when I came into the guard, not many people could type, and that's how I was able to get on um, onto the active guard reserve program. I was one out of ninety people um, that when they asked uh, when our personnel sergeant had left on our uh, emergency um, uh, leave and they said how many here can type and I was the only one out of 90 people that raised their hand and so then they put me in front of the computer and then I was working for the entire drill, <laughs> drill weekend and and I was like uh, what am I doing here <laughs> but the commander was so impressed that after after that weekend was over that he offered offered me to come on full-time with the active guard and reserve program about a year later it did now as far as as far as time, you're going to get frustrated during your transition, uh, whether you're guard and reserve and you're going from one civilian employer to another, or if you're active duty coming coming into the civilian workforce. Everybody gets, I, I, I haven't yet to come across that veteran or that service member uh, or spouse that are trans, transitioning from from uh, from anywhere that has not had that problem where you're frustrated. And that goes on to more, like I said, before it was more paper you were more in in front of people and 
and now you have the dawn of the internet which has been around for a while computers have taken over and that computer takes a lot of the personality away from the hiring man from the hiring management in my in, in my personal view now john before we continue i just want to highlight to the audience listening at home what you were saying about a quarter of the way through that speech there ladies and gentlemen the transition out of the military starts before you transition out. That's something both KP and I love to preach wherever we go. John was highlighting that you need to be networking, contacting companies, working on your resume, and even just making connections in and out of the military while you're still serving so that come time to transition out, you're not three, four steps back while everybody else is at least semi-ready. That's actually a really great point, Avi. And one of the things I want to mention with that as well, I always say that your transition begins the first day that you start in the Army, possibly even before that. And I recently had asked some recruiters about, you know, a lot of the folks that come in here and they enlist, that you obviously figure out what their goals are. Does anyone here follow up with those goals? Does anyone, after they're done with their basic and AIT, does anyone call them up and say, hey, did you enroll in college? Did you do this? Did you you know, whatever it was that your goals were. And their answer to me was, well, they send us a picture of them after. And I'm like, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Are you keeping them honest and keeping them accountable? And I understand that they can't. They have like so many people. And I think that's the gap that where it starts as far as getting off on the right foot when you get to your first duty station or when you show up to your unit on day one. And I signed up for the National Guard at the end of 1998, and I went to basic training in 1999, John. And I'll, and I'll tell you this, from my perspective, two things that changed the Guard specifically and just changed the whole field that we're talking about, it was the Internet and then 9-11. And um, because before that, it was sort of rare for a lot of units to, to deploy. And once 9-11 happened, the, the reserve units and the National Guard units were getting deployed you know, quite a bit. And so a lot of the folks that were just kind of there and like you were talking about type and you know, not being able to type and stuff that a lot of those folks were from what I saw, they were sort of filtered out and they, they got out and then the new, the new blood came in, the guys that, you know, wanted to be there and could actually, you know, do certain things. And I don't know, was that your experience as well? Did you see kind of a, a, a flush of different national guardsmen when, when nine 11 happened? Uh, yes, I did, KP. It's um, when 9/11 happened. I was in in the armory, uh, the Springfield, uh, Georgia armory that morning, and it, it, was, it was a sad thing. My uh, our supply sergeant came running in, and he was telling us what was going on. And uh, at that point, we immediately went into action. I, I, my redness NCO, uh, I was E5 at that point, and I looked over and I said, hey, we just came back from drill, and our vehicles need to be topped off. We need to be ready to go. They're already starting to talk about you know, us guarding the airports uh, or guarding the armories, mm-hmm. guarding certain installations, and it was a lot of com- mass confusion you know, of that day. And so we immediately went into action. We started running vehicles back and forth. We had a lot of people. We didn't even ask them to come. If it was in the unit that lived local, they were already showing up in uniform and helping us perform the task as far as on that, as far as with 9-11. And uh, we've kind of freaked out the small little town of Springfield, Georgia, because they, they saw military vehicles running up and down the road, and they thought we were being invaded. And it was, uh, like I said, a lot of mass confusion that day. <laughs> But um, like like you were saying, back to what you were saying, KP, as far as on the transitioning soldiers, like I said, I was learning how to, I had already learned how to type. I had learned in high school, and uh, that was one of the key components that made me success uh, as far as in the keyboarding class. But then, yes, there was a lot of older soldiers that knew how to do things, pencil, uh, pencil in hand, and in comparison to the computer. Uh, I went from the combat engineers over to field artillery. So I was in the field artillery when 9-11 happened. And then a few years later, I, w- I went and transferred back over to field artillery, and I was a staff sergeant. And the same people that were there when they were still E-4s or E-5s um, were still E-5s and or E-4s, and they haven't moved up. And then here I come back as a staff sergeant, and then they used to be over me, and now I'm over them. So that was a... That was a big challenge. I mean, it showed the difference as far as 
uh, the dawn of the computer internet age and and coming in between both sides but the good thing is that I learned both cycles I had an opportunity to learn both cycles so when it came into when the computer breaks down which hey when you're out in the field internet goes down what do you do and you got a lot of fire mission and you're showing it by hand and the person uh, the, those that came in after me says I only know how to do it by computer how do you do it um, how do you do a fire mission by hand well let me show you Yes, it's a little bit more tedious. It's a little bit more uh, strenuous. But then, like I said, that's like I said, there was a major transition as far as on the computer. So a lot did get out and leave. Those that retired, those that had, those went through retirements and all that, and says, "Hey, we, this is a whole new era of um, a, a way of doing things." And then many do not want to learn once they are settled. Uh, if you're not flexible as far as in the change then that's where you kind of get left behind. Yeah, and I just want to go back, John, to what we talked about a few minutes ago. You talked about resumes, and I wrote down a few, uh, at least two things that you talked about that were sort of some tips on how folks can better create resumes to get that next step in the process for hiring. One was creating your own resume and having that personality about it versus having someone else do it. Two was making sure that you have multiple resumes. So you mentioned ZipRecruiter, Indeed. Do you have any additional tips for folks out there that are possibly doing their best to create good resumes that represent themselves on paper, but may not fully have it yet and are looking to get some tips or some hacks on what they can do better to make a better representation of themselves on paper uh yes i do as far as not just with indeed and zip recruiter because that's the, well, a lot of ones i get um there's also linkedin linkedin is a digital resume in my opinion it's it, it could put down all all your focus all your education down in one and that's why i try to tell people if you're a military serviceman there's no reason that you shouldn't have a linkedin account and there's no reason that you should have the premium account with it because it's free to you i have that deer in the headlights look again as far as on that so that's one tip right there uh as far as with the linkedin as far as on the resumes as far as other personal resumes then you have to look at it whether or not are you looking in the civilian sector or are you looking into the federal state sector and on the federal side there's usa jobs that's a totally different form resume format i know uh, we have done classes to that on the virtual ourselves as far as on both sides as far as just a regular civilian and a federal resume i know the uso has 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 done a lot of classes as well on that they they share online forums with that so like i said when i say multiple resumes it depends on what you're looking for um as far as like i said you have your indeed you have your zip recruiter you got your linkedin so this is where i'm saying your resume start growing uh you have your usa jobs and then you have your personal resume now when you get to the personal resume the issue that i've always seen with veterans has been the online so like i said uh, is trying to apply online and this is where I say you're going to have multiple versions of your regular civilian resume and the reason why I say that is that when you apply for a company uh, I'm going to I'm going to say this first thing you need to look when you see the jobs posted for that company for most of these corporations is that look at the posting date of it if it's more than two weeks then I would say don't apply for it reason why is because they've already started the vetting process and anything has been emailed to them after the fact uh goes into a dead docket uh file now, i have seen this personally i have been coached by um by other corporations military liaisons to some big corporations and it's uh, and and seeing this process it really takes away not just from veterans but from anyone in in, in general and um and it's and it's it's very tragic because they miss out on a lot of opportunities on people. So when, when I look at that, um, so when, when the jobs itself come, come available, look at that, that, um, that posting date on there. The next thing is word association. If you're spending three minutes or three to five minutes sending your resume out, then you're doing something wrong. Uh, the reason I say that, as far as on that, you need to pull up that job description. You need to do the word association. A lot of these companies have the word associate, uh, so association algorithms uh, as far as um, kind of search engines that, um, that they're looking at. 
And so depending on what that means is that the job description, they take 20, 30 percent of that job description, they take the keywords and they type it into the system. And it'll do a search based off the application or the resume that you send them. And that knocks out anywhere, from, let's say you had 100 um, people apply, that knocks out anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of the applications that go through. Because uh, like I said, military personnel uh, or military servicemen, we use a lot of jargon, use a lot of acronyms, and that computer is not going to recognize it. And then and also on top of that, when you're looking at, at that, make sure you meet the 100 percent requirements, whether it's uh, education, you have it listed somewhere. If it's education, you have it um, the time that if they're asking for a number of years experience, make sure you have that uh, in your resume and you're staying focused, you're staying on target with it. Uh, I had a, had a spouse that um, reached out to me. She said, John, I applied for 100 jobs and I only got two callbacks. And one, I had to call myself. And what can you do to help me? And so I was telling her these tips of the trade, you know, say, hey, you got to do the word association, you got to look at the job itself, and then go back out and apply. Well, she applied, and she applied for 10 more jobs in human resources field, and she got seven callbacks out of the 10. So it, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a process, and I told her, I said, you have to plug and play, and, you know, hopefully one day you get 10 out of 10, but it's, because uh, that was the first question I asked her. I said, did you send the same exact resume to all 100 positions? She says, yes, I did. So it was like, now I said, try the word association, try to read and tweak it. So when, when I say word association, like a lot of cases come up and say, uh, you know, like supply, uh, logistics, clerk, uh, specialist. So that's that's where it comes into it a lot when it comes into position titles. Um, it could be a lot of other things, like I was saying, heavy wheel mechanic earlier and then diesel engine mechanic. Two different means the same things, but you got to make sure you do the word association. Uh, when it comes to education, I used to not tell um, I used to not tell um, in can our candidates to. Uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I used to not oh, tell our candidates that to put their high school education if they had a higher degree of education. One, I've always looked at it. Well, if you have a higher degree of education, chances are you have a high school diploma or GED. And, but then it depends on that recruiter whether or not they plugged in the correct um, information. Did they add in high school diploma, GED, associate degree, bachelor's, doctorate, and... I've seen that where the the person that had the associate degree but didn't have their high school diploma listed, and they they were able to go through the hiring next hiring process, and then the um, and then the one that had just hadn't put their on their high school diploma actually went through the hiring process. So and that's where the computer again um, takes a lot away from 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 the candidates out there for as far as on selections. And it's, 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 like I said, again, it's tragic. And, but that's the way that the computers has really run this in, in industry as far as in recruiting. And then coming down to applying for the jobs. If you apply for more of it, I asked this question to, um, uh, to every candidate. When you apply online, do you apply for more than one job at one time? And I usually get a yes on that. And then I said, well, there's another issue there too. If you apply, I'm going to just say for three jobs, if you're applying for A, B, and C, and that recruiter opens up job B, then when the, they finally open up the vetting process for job A and C, that system will show that they're already in the process, no matter where they're at in job B, and they'll basically omit them. So the recruiters don't even see those other two resume or the same resumes in the other two job um, applications. So a lot of people think, well, hey, I apply for six, seven jobs on there, and I didn't. I only got one uh, referral back, or then said, oh, I'm not. You know, it wasn't the job I was looking for. I wasn't really, you know, close to it. That was a job that was open, and the other six was um, basically omitted. And if you apply for too many jobs at the same time, that computer system will think you're a spam network trying to get in and infiltrate their system, and then they'll block you all together from ever applying again. And then that's where you have to go and get new emails and and and, and, and new points of contact so you can you can attempt again. And it's very frustrating. It, it really is. 
Now, John, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to what you're saying right now. And if your anecdote wasn't enough proof that you know what you're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, John is an employment manager for Work for Warriors. I mean, his experience goes back years and he's seen it all. This is definitely the advice you want to be taking. Now, John, following on that, what are some pinpoint accurate or effective networking strategies that you've seen people effectively use, especially as a military service member transitioning into the civilian world? Well, I'll say you're always networking, whether when you're in grade school to to now through the military and retire, you're always networking, whether it's for friendship, for uh, personal or professional reasons. Uh, you know, like I said, a lot of your personal network can become your professional. Uh, I would say my best success over the last couple of years has been through LinkedIn. I mean, in the last six months alone, I've gotten a lot of referrals through connections. That's why I'm here tonight. Uh, that's how we, uh, we end up networking between our, our, our mutual connections. And, and like I said, that's why I have the opportunity to speak with, with you. Um, so that's what I'm saying, networking as far as on LinkedIn. Uh, the others, like I said, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, they're more of a personal uh, networking site. And so you don't get, you get a lot of personal along with professional. That's why I like LinkedIn so much as far as on the professional. And over the last, like I said, over the last six months, it's definitely uh, became a great tool. I've been able to share contacts. Uh, a lot of them in, in this past quarter or long since October started, uh, I've, I've help coach 15 uh, servicemen and using the LinkedIn tools. Um, 13 out of the 15 was using the LinkedIn tools that they have on there. So it's, uh, that's a great social networking site. Again, it's uh, or for, for professional, uh, professional networking. Uh, as far as the networking itself, I mean, it, it gives you a world of opportunities uh, as far as uh, advancing your career, advancing your education, and then also too when you're ready to have that um if you're ready to uh, excuse me if you're ready to have that um uh, referral when it comes to you always have to have references especially in the professional world i'll say this much john you know anyone out there listening that's wondering about networking you're right you're networking almost all the time the number one thing that you have to do with networking is you have to put yourself out there and how you could do that today is virtually. And when you're talking about LinkedIn, that's exactly what that is. Back in the day before the internet, the way you put yourself out there was you showed up to events or you showed up to places and you met you know, folks that were of certain positions that you wanted or maybe you're interested in or wanted to do a little research about. Well, today, it's a lot simpler. You simply just go in and it blows my mind every time I, I mention to someone who's currently in the military, hey, do you have a LinkedIn? They say no. And I'm like, well, why not? Like, that is the number one way to put yourself out there in position to network with folks. And you never know. It's kind of a passive way of always being available and always being present and making those connections with folks. And that's how you and I got connected was through LinkedIn. So <laughs> I really appreciate you being on the, on the show today and listening to a, a few of our different episodes from the past, John. I really appreciate that. And well, before we wrap things I'm, up, I'm John, sorry. I just want to ask you, is there anything speci- no, is there anything specifically that you'd like to tell the audience out there uh, just to summarize everything that uh, we've talked about in this episode? I, I, I'll tell them you're going to, like I said, you're going to be uh, definitely frustrated at some point during your military transitioning. Uh, you're going to be told that you're not um, – you're not suitable for the job that, that you're you're trying to apply for and you're kind of like what i used to do this in the military but then again too military and civilian are two different things uh, it's a totally different networking be humble look at the entry level programs for most of them, regardless of what uh previous rank that you've held um I always say try to look at going to the entry level try not to be the manager try not to be the boss because like i said uh, a lot of times, like I said, uh, Georgia Tech even said it best, 74% that try to go for those key management roles and all that do not last after six months. And reason why is because of the different personality brands on that. So like I said, uh, continue continue fighting the fight. Look out there for every organization out there that, um, that can seek out there and help you. Like I said, the American Legion, uh, also the VFW, uh, a lot of those that are needing um, 
you know, as far as personalities, they have um, a lot of resources there that can help you as well. Uh, like I said, uh, the Worth Warriors program uh, and some other sister organizations of other states are available. You just have to seek them out. And, um, and like I said, everything else. But like I said, the, per the best thing you can do right now that I have learned is to get on LinkedIn and start doing your connections now. Uh, whether it's you're reaching out to your former buddies or your former supervisors that we used to be in the military with start reaching out to them and ask them and say hey what was your what was your issues when you transition out can you give me any tips because that's what i'm about to getting out as well and the issue and one of the biggest issues i still have is that many do not have a plan and i i my most recent i was a transitional over over at fort stewart and I had five active duty soldiers and not one of them had a plan even though they were going to the tap classes, they wasn't taking, and I could see that they wasn't taking it very seriously. And I said, all right, if you not, if you don't have a plan and then have a multiple plan and then have um, opportunities and to your plan, then you need to rethink and stay in the military until you decide or until you have a plan of, of your transition. Uh, Cause it's, I, again, when many think that they uh, can just, leave the military and join into a civilian workforce it, uh they're very mistaken so it's uh like i said it's it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of opportunities but then you have to really educate yourself research and educate is about the two main things i can say and network excuse me uh that you can do to um, make yourself successful in the transition most definitely, John. And I think you hit the nail on the head right there when you talked about planning. And there was someone that once told me that when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And I think that's number one in itself. Um, and I want to jump over to Avi. Avi, for this episode, man, do you have anything in summary that you'd like to put out there for the audience? Uh, you know, I don't think so. I think John did a great job of summarizing and highlighting everything that we want to preach to people transitioning both in and out of the service. I think that, John, you hit a lot of the key points, a lot of the points of confusion and ambiguity, especially for the younger people going into the service. So just great episode today, and I highly recommend that everybody listening take heed of John's advice over here. I, I appreciate John, it. John, anyone I mean... out there listening... Do you just serve George? Do you just serve Georgia, or is there folks uh, from all across the United States? Can they connect with you and ask you questions? And what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? I, I say the best way right now is through LinkedIn. I, I've increased my follower. Uh, like I said, in the last six months, I went from 200 followers up to almost over 600 now. That I looked, I think I was 609 when I looked at it. So I've had um, actually. Uh, individual uh, just reach out to me her and her husband are getting ready to come off Air Force since she was referred to me by another uh, another person that was connected with me and she was just asking some questions that my husband and I were planning on moving to Georgia uh, so yes I, I, I we serve the state of Georgia but then like I said we have other people from coming from other states if you're a transitional service member if you're going to another state or if you're looking at going we like I said we do have a lot of connections um, nationwide uh through the other national guard and, and reserve programs so uh i say personally like i said it, regardless of where you live i've had like i said i've had active duty from over in germany or in this ask me questions and say i just reached out and say hey what do you think you know what should i do looking at it but i would say as far as the state if you're a transitional service member and i have to and i have to kind of be a little biased i said georgia is is one of the best as far as in the veteran communities, uh, we have over 700,000 uh, veterans that live in our state, and it's um, and it's growing by like 10 percent every year, and that's not including the spouses. So we're looking at like over a million between um, spouses and, and veterans, and that's not including the ones that serve on active duty or in our guard or reserve. It's uh, veterans that have transitioned out and everything else like that. So we're a very heavy populated veteran state. So if you're looking for work, uh, the chances are when I talked about 94% of those veteran uh, of those uh, organizations that do not have uh, a veteran working for them, their percentage goes a lot lower here in Georgia because, like I said, with the the big veteran base, and then we have a lot of incentives uh, for veterans to 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 come to our state and and, and work. So, 
The state of Georgia thanks you for <laughs> praising them so much. I know Georgia is a beautiful state in itself. And, John, I just want to thank you for joining us today on the morning formation. As for Avi, John, and myself, formation is over. You can fall out. I want you to stay tuned, stay focused, and stay motivated. Warriors, fall out.